time for me to change your direction, you ought to be willing to say, wherever it is, God will have Amen. And that's going to probably be the next wherever. That's the next message. So Jesus takes the most despised and rejected symbol of his time and says that if you want to take, if you want to follow me, then you've got to take this up. He's making it clear, or at least I think he's making it clear, that following him is, means taking up your cross and dying to yourself. And that's what a follower is committed to. He's saying that if you take up that cross and you follow him down that Via Dolorosa, Don's going to sing about it, I understand, here in a couple of weeks, the Via Dolorosa, aren't you? <laughs> you had that deer in the headlight look there for a minute. <laughs> Called the way of suffering. <laughs> he says, if you're going to follow me, then there's going to be a way of suffering by following me. History tells us, word tells us, that many of those that followed him here on earth, they followed him down this same path. According to tradition, Matthew was killed by a sword in Ethiopia. Mark died in Egypt after being dragged by horses through the street. Luke was hanged in Greece. Peter was crucified upside down. Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India during a missionary trip. The brother of Jesus, Jude, was killed with arrows when he refused to deny faith in his brother, but not his brother Christ, which was his brother two ways. James was beheaded in Jerusalem. A decision to follow Jesus is a decision to die to yourself. And let's bring it down a little more personal today. Unfortunately, there are many churches today have decided that the message of the cross is too uncomfortable. It's not politically correct. It's not soothing enough so they need to change the message. It's too offensive. And as a result, there are many, there are many people today who are attending churches who call themselves followers, but they're not carrying a cross. <clears throat> We've all seen those commercials, usually around Christmas time, about the, the Snuggies. Everybody know what a Snuggie is? I call it a backwards bathroom. <laughs> but anyway. They're, they're trying to sell you this Snuggie because it's warm and it's comfortable and it's just so pleasant. Well, I think that our, many of our churches have developed what I call a Snuggie theology. The third Snuggie theology promises health and wealth and warmth and comfort to anybody who would follow Christ. But the problem <coughs> with the Snuggie theology is that you see the results of that snuggy theology when things start going rough in an individual's life. Let their health decline. Let their wealth deteriorate. And the first thing they say is, where is that that God promised me when I joined his ranks? Preacher didn't tell me it was going to involve this. He just says, come on board, join, everything will be okay. Preacher lied to you. So they start to question God. They start to question God because according to the gospel that was presented to them, God's not holding up his end of the bargain. One person described it like this, and I like it. It says, what you win them with is what you win them to. Amen. Amen. Understand? What you win them with is what you win them to. If you tell them everything's going to be wonderful, hunky door, and there's not going to be any problem, that's what they're going to do in serving God and believe. But if you tell them they're going to have to carry the cross, it's going to cost them something, they can be prepared for when the devil stands up and slaps you in the face and says, you don't want to go to church with that. I think there are a lot of well-intended preachers who adopt this snuggy theology when they find that attendance isn't what it used to be or what they want it to be or what they hope for and that the offerings are down. We could call that the new vision. Vision, right? Down is down. Offerings are down. But when 
you, when you have that type of mentality, before you know it, the preacher ends up gauging his success and the church's success by Sunday statistics. And believe me, I promise you it's easy to do. Am I happy that all these pews are in this world? Absolutely not. I know why some of them are in I talked about it earlier. I'm mad at the devil. Because he knows what change to pull. He knows how to get people out of church. Even if it's not by their own choice. So they start judging their success by Sunday statistics. So all of a sudden, in order to change those Sunday statistics, the sermons get sanitized and scriptures get edited and the cross gets covered up. There may be sermons about salvation, but there's never a sermon about surrender. There are sermons about forgiveness, but there's never sermons about repentance. What's the difference in that? I told you before that repentance means turning and going the opposite direction that you've been going in. You hear sermons about living, but you don't hear sermons about dying. And as a preacher, you find that it's all too easy to find yourself presenting the parts of the Bible that will become more popular. Oh, it would have been a lot easier if I hadn't chosen Luke 9.23 this morning. I could have chosen John 3.16. That would have been a whole lot more acceptable this morning, right? Right? Amen. Thank you. So, so preachers find themselves choosing those parts that they don't think is going to be received too well and they dress them up with creative language in an attempt to not be so offensive. Instead of the uncompromised and unfiltered truth from God's Word, people are given this more pleasant, palatable, palatable version of God's gospel. And in doing so, the gospel is robbed of its power. And the people are robbed from what God's purposes are in their lives. If I don't preach the whole truth to you, the good, the bad, and the ugly, then you may never know that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And when that happens, those preachers become... Like an individual that I read a story about this week, his name was Robert Courtney. I don't know if anybody knows who Robert Courtney is or heard anything about him, but he was convicted of diluting medications for cancer patients in order to make a profit. And as the story goes, for a period of about nine years, he diluted some estimated 98,000 prescriptions of medications affecting some 4,200 patients. And as a result, at least 17 cancer patients died after receiving these diluted formulations of chemotherapy. Now, he made some $19 million from the fraud that was sentenced to 30 years in prison. So you have a man that's entrusted with the handling of handing out life-saving medication but for the sake of personal gain, diluted it to the point where he couldn't help them at all. What's that got to do with preachers and the gospel? To me, that's the picture of any preacher, myself included, <coughs> should it be that way with me, of anybody who would dilute the message of the cross. The cross is not a pretty message. Blood is not a pretty message. But it's the message of the cross. It's the message that must be preached to a lost and dying world. Because without the cross, without the blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Amen. And if a preacher doesn't preach the cross and doesn't preach the blood, then their motives are just as bad as Robert Courtney's is. It's selfish motives. They want to get their statistics up and make them look good. But you know what? If the results are the same, in fact, the results are worse because there's much more at stake. Yes, there's 42 people who lost their life. God bless them. 
But we're talking the souls of people who die. We may find this offensive, what I'm getting ready to say now, but I believe it's the truth. Jesus did not come to this earth so that we could be better behaved or so that he could tweak our personalities or fine-tune our manners or smooth out our rough spots. He didn't even come to the world to change us. He, the truth is the gospel came to this world so that we could die to ourselves. Now along the way, he smooths out the rough spots. He tweaks our personality. He does all these things. But that wasn't his purpose for coming. That's, that's kind of like the whipped cream on top of the dessert or the cherry on top of the whipped cream. That just comes with it. Goes back to the receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've shared this with some of you before. Some of you may not have heard it. man was trying to talk about receiving the Holy Spirit. He said, when well, you get the Holy Spirit, he said, you, you, you don't try to seek tongues. You seek the Holy Spirit. The tongues just come with the Holy Spirit. Like going to buy a pair of shoes. You don't ask for a pair of tongues. You ask for the shoes. Tongues come with the shoes. Jesus didn't come to tweak our personalities and smooth out the rough spot. That just comes with him saving us. He said, I came that you could die to yourself and to this world. When Jesus calls us to follow him, he says, take up your cross. Now, that indicates to me, when he says take up your cross, that indicates to me that we have a choice. Now that's not how we typically think of death, is it? We don't like that choice. Uh, we think of death as something that we don't choose, that it just happens against our will. But when the King of Kings died on the hill of Calvary, it was an example for us to follow. The phrase cross to bear, we, we've all used that phrase, well I've got a cross to bear. So-and-so is bearing a cross for Christ. It's just become part of our vernacular day. It's just something that we use all the time. And it's often used when there's something challenging, some situation or some responsibility that's been put on us that's against our will. For a follower of Christ, a, cry, a cross is not forced on us. It's taken up. It doesn't make you take the cross. You take up the cross. I voluntarily just decide that I'm going to be persecuted for you. Because if I'm not going to follow you, I'm not going to be persecuted. So therefore, if I'm going to follow you, I'm going to be persecuted. So you voluntarily take it up. And Jesus sets the example in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 18, where he says, No one takes it up from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. So he set the example. Nobody's going to make me take it. I take it up my own. Jesus invites us to take up our cross. The problem is, that's where we often leave the invitation. But the next word makes all the difference. The word is daily. Take up your cross daily. Every day, we make a decision that we will die to ourselves and live for Jesus. In some way, shape, form, or fashion. Some more than others. But... Dying to ourselves, we need to understand this, dying to ourselves is not a one-time decision. When you accept Jesus Christ in your life, it's not a one-time decision. Amen. Amen. See, that's... I'm not trying to take away from that moment of salvation. That's the most important moment in your life. Bar and none that's happened to you up to that point in your life. I don't mean to take away from it. But that's not the most important part and challenging part of dying. If, if you view Jesus Christ as a one-time decision, that's like saying after your wedding, well, I'm married now, so I'll go back to life as usual. Kind of the same analogy. It don't work that way. I'm all of you know that. There's more to being a husband and wife than a wedding ceremony. There's more to following Christ and taking up your cross than accepting Him into your heart and life. 